grim quiz to start off today's video. Of all the conflicts to take place entirely in this blood-soaked century, which has been the deadliest? It's a pretty tough question, right? With so many to choose from, I mean, it's difficult to say. Maybe it's Ukraine, where vicious fighting continues to rage. Maybe it's Syria, with its bitter civil war that lasted a decade. Or it could be Yemen, or Afghanistan, or perhaps even Mexico's drug war. But we're going to go out on a limb and say that very few would guess the actual victor. The war that, according to recent studies, killed more than any other this century. Ethiopia's Tigray War. Taking place between November 2020 and November 2022, the Tigray War was one of the bloodiest civil conflicts this generation has seen. At its height, as many as a million soldiers were fighting, with a thousand people dying every day. Overall, it's thought that 600,000 people lost their lives. Yet somehow, the world seemed to miss this conflagration. While fighting in Ukraine and Syria dominated the headlines, the Tigray War passed silently by like a ship in the night. But how did this happen? How did global society ignore such a horrifying conflict? Well, today we're investigating the truth behind this century's deadliest war and why the world turned a blind eye to it. If confirmed, it would be a scale of destruction not seen for decades. When the Tigray War officially ended in November of 2022, it left behind a shattered land over which unbelievable volumes of blood had been spilled. Taking place mostly within the Tigray region of northern Ethiopia, it had seen local armed forces clash with the central government in a catastrophe that dragged in not just other states' militia, but also the military of neighboring Eritrea. With battles on a jaw-dropping scale and atrocities against civilians, it was simply one of the biggest conflicts of our time. It was as shocking and as intense as anything happening elsewhere. Yet it's only when you look at the estimated death tolls that you start to grasp how truly awful the Tigray War was, how biblical in its destruction. Since exact casualty figures are unknown, there are a range of estimates. Some lower, some higher but they all tell a similar story of large-scale suffering. The African Union's lead negotiator in peace talks, Olusogun Obasanjo, put the number of deaths at 600,000. Shortly after the conflict ended, the USA's ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, gave her government's estimate of over half a million dead. The EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs, meanwhile, has claimed anywhere between 600,000 and 800,000 were killed in the conflict. The higher number, if proved, would place the Tigray War on the same level as the Rwanda Genocide. These distressing figures were backed up by researchers at the University of Ghent in Belgium who tried to track deaths as the conflict was unfolding. By analyzing field reports and using models to extrapolate civilian suffering, the team estimated a range of between 200,000 and 300,000 battlefield deaths and 300,000 to 400,000 civilians. They broke the civilian deaths down in the following categories. Speaking to Arpe's researcher, Jan Nyssen claimed that 10% had died due to direct actions like bombings and atrocities, 30% had died due to lack of access to healthcare in the conflict zone, while a staggering 60% had starved to death. And now we'll cover exactly how the Tigray War came to be so deadly in a later chapter. For now, though, we want to dwell on those figures for just a little bit to help you appreciate just how shocking they really are. And perhaps the best way to do that is by comparing Tigray fatalities to those of other 21st century conflicts. Uh, let's start with perhaps the most notorious of all, uh, the Syrian Civil War. Taking place mostly between 2011 and 2021, the Syrian conflict was defined by chaos and atrocity with different factions fighting bitterly in the shadow of civilian mass murders. But even this nightmare, which included half the conflict against ISIS, is thought to have killed fewer. The UN in 2022 estimated around 350,000 casualties, nor has the Ukraine war killed so many. While exact numbers are impossible to confirm, Western powers estimate tens of thousands of dead soldiers on both sides, with perhaps another 100,000 civilians killed. Go looking at other infamous conflicts this century, and the results the same. Yemen, Darfur, Myanmar, Mexico's drug war. As awful as they all are, none resulted in so much death. In fact, the Tigray's war only contender is the Second Congo War, which led to maybe three million fatalities. But this was a 20th century war, born of the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide that spilled over into the new millennium. For a purely 21st century war, Tigray is untouched. Now, we mentioned this not to engage in some 
ghoulish game of top trumps, but to emphasize just how crazy it is that this conflict just passed us by. If the totals are true, we somehow missed the deadliest conflict in over 20 years. And how that happens requires some serious analysis. Of course, it's possible the estimates are wildly off. The Ethiopian government, for example, maintains that overall fatalities were closer to 80,000. Still, as we'll shortly see, there are good reasons to suspect the Ethiopian government isn't exactly a reliable source, not least because of their central role in this East African apocalypse. While the main focus of this video is the conflict's death toll and how it became so widely ignored, we can't really discuss this without further explaining what happened. So this chapter is the basic crib sheet version of the Tigray War, but we really need to emphasize the basic part here. The war was extremely complex, and there's no way that we could do all of the nuances justice in the next few minutes. Instead, we'll simply try and hit the major points, one of the most major being the history of bad blood between the Tigrayans and some of Ethiopia's other ethnic groups. Prior to the war breaking out, Tigrayans held a stranglehold on national politics for 27 years in the form of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF. Coming to power in 1991, the TPLF were part of the alliance that overthrew the Derg, the Marxist military junta that had ruled Ethiopia with an iron fist since the 1970s. The Derg had been responsible for awful atrocities against Tigrayans. The Ethiopian famine of the mid-1980s was at least in part so deadly because the Derg used it as a cover to starve thousands of their enemies. So when the TPLF gained power in the form of President and Prime Minister Mela Zanawi, it seemed only only fair that Tigrayans should get a shot at the top job. But TBLF rule would not be without controversy. While Zanawi's autocracy turbocharged Ethiopia's development, his government also marginalized other minorities, such as the Amhara, Somali, and Oromo. In Tigray itself, local forces committed abuse against Wakhatis. And, well, we say minorities here. Each of these groups is bigger than the Tigrayans. Yet careful political maneuvering meant the TPLF were always near the pinnacle of power. That continued even after Zanawi's 2012 death. Right up until 2018, the TPLF kept on running things as they always had, as part of a coalition of four ethnic parties that they always managed to dominate. But then came the mother of all political earthquakes. In 2018, the four-party coalition made Abiy Ahmed its leader. And Oromo, Abiy broke the Tigrayan stranglehold on Ethiopia for the first time in decades. By 2019, he'd dissolved the four-party coalition, creating the new Prosperity Party. Basically, the same coalition as before, only now minus the TPLF. For their part, the TPLF retreated to their base in northern Tigray to lick their wounds and wait for the next general election scheduled for 2020. But we all remember what happened in 2020. COVID-19 swept the world. This was a pandemic that Abiy took as the perfect excuse to delay the elections. In Tigray, the TPLF reacted with nuclear outrage. Rather than follow orders, they held scheduled regional elections in defiance of the government, warning that any attempts to stop the vote in Tigray would be considered an act of war. When the regional ballots were counted that September, the TPLF had won a resounding victory. But celebrations would be short-lived. No sooner had the TPLF declared victory than Abbey began publicly accusing them of attacking government bases to loot weapons. To this day, it's uncertain how true these accusations were. What is true, though, is that on November 4, 2020, Abbey ordered national defense forces into Tigray on a military operation designed to bring the region to heel. Instead, it would wind up almost drowning Ethiopia in a sea of blood. What began as small-scale clashes quickly grew in intensity as militias from the neighboring Amhara region in Eritrea joined on the Ethiopian government side. At first, it looked like the TPLF had been crushed, that the war would end with an easy victory for Abiy. But then came the 2021 summer counteroffensive that shook the nation. Sweeping out their bases in the mountains, the TPLF rolled over Ethiopia like a tsunami. By fall, they'd retaken Tigray. By the end of the year, they'd expelled Eritrea troops across the border. Come 2022, and the rebels were marching toward the capital of Addis Ababa, far south of Tigray. A shock TPLF victory looked like it was just around the corner. But no. The rebels were pushed back to their power base as Ethiopia deployed powerful Turkish and UAE drones to regain the advantage. After a short ceasefire, the conflict then re-erupted in the fall of 2022, this time 
it being worse than ever. With Eritrea conscripting all men between 18 and 50 to fight, Amhara regional forces running wild, and Ethiopia's federal forces using human wave tactics, Tigray became one giant kill zone. This is the era when a thousand were dying every day, when the clashing of up to a million men made it likely the biggest war being fought anywhere in the world. Finally, though, in early November 2022, the Tigray conflict reached its bitter end. At a peace conference in Pretoria, South Africa, the TPLF agreed to permanently disarm and demobilize and hand control of Tigray to the federal authorities. In return, the Ethiopian government agreed to restore and rebuild the ruined region and take part in a transitional justice program. And just like that, the century's deadliest war was over. Except it wasn't. I mean, not really. Although the fighting had stopped, there was still the sheer number of fatalities to contend with, to figure out how a region of six million could have witnessed 600,000 deaths in just two years. It's a grim mystery that we're gonna try and unravel in the next chapter. No civil conflict is ever orderly. Occasionally, though, you get one that goes from peace to widespread atrocity, in the blink of an eye. Usually, this is due to grievances that have been simmering under the surface for decades, religious animosity as in Syria, or ethnic rivalry as in the collapse of Yugoslavia. In the case of the Tigray War, old tensions between Tigrayans and the Amhara and the Wakhati turned what was sold as a limited military incursion into a disaster zone in mid days. The atrocities started within hours of Abbey ordering the assault on Tigray. Government forces announced their arrival by shelling villages, killing scores of civilians. But it wouldn't just be federal forces that were responsible for the staggering death toll. Civilians would also turn on one another with distressing cruelty. The first known massacre occurred on November the 9th, five days into the conflict. In the small town of Maikadra, near the border with Sudan, Tigrayans attacked Amhara civilians using machetes and axes to hack them to death. Hours later, an Amhara military rode into town and returned the favor, slaughtering Tigrayan civilians. Overall, 229 people were killed. The massacre set the tone for the rest of the war. A war in which Tigrayans made up the majority of the casualties, but in which all sides and all forces committed terrible crimes. That included government forces. By November the 19th, 2020, credible reports were filtering out of federal troops burning villages, destroying livestock, and summarily executing civilians suspected of supporting the TPLF. By then, most of Tigray was under federal control, and as other forces and militia began to get involved, Things only got worse. In 2022, Human Rights Watch released a long report on the conflict titled, We Will Erase You From This Land, after a particularly chilling quote by an Amhara Special Forces officer. In it, the organization described a whirlwind of death sweeping through Tigray. Placing heavy blame on Amhara military for the atrocities, they detailed how, to quote, Amhara security forces acting under newly appointed Amhara and Wakati officials have been responsible for extrajudicial executions, rape, and other acts of sexual violence. The report described, too, how Tigrayan civilians had been funneled into makeshift camps where they were beaten, tortured, and murdered. How Fano militia entered towns that government had subdued and walked down the street, shooting anyone they saw until the bodies piled so high that a tractor was needed to remove them all. It was a classic depiction of ethnic cleansing, of the sort perpetuated back in the Bosnian War. At its height, Human Rights Watch reported, quote, gross violations of human rights, including rapes, the mutilation of women and girls to ensure infertility, mass killings, and torture, just as in Bosnia. No side was completely innocent. After Eritrean forces started committing war crimes against Tigrayans, Tigrayans located refugees from Eritrea and murdered them in bloody revenge killings. When the TPLF's counteroffensive saw it seize control of swaths of Amhara and Afar states, more blood was shed by making their civilians pay for the horrors inflicted on Tigray. And we're sorry if this is all unbelievably bleak. But it's the painful truth of wars like this. There's no glamour, there's no adventure, it's just the senseless ending of so many lives in so many awful ways. And that includes soldiers too. While civilian casualties outstripped the battlefield deaths, the last months of the Tigray War decimated all armed forces involved. 
In the final weeks, human wave attacks saw hundreds upon hundreds cut down on killing fields worse even than those around Bakhmut in Ukraine. As one Degrand fighter told the Telegraph after a battle, quote, I saw the bodies of my friends scattered. Almost everyone had died. Yet for all the horrors of battle and atrocities visited on civilians, violent deaths are estimated to have made up less than half of all those killed in the Degrand War to really understand what made this conflict so deadly. We have to look at the most controversial action of all, the decision by Abby at the beginning of the war that would ultimately end so many lives, the decision to blockade Tigray. From the moment federal forces rushed the border on November the 4th, 2020, the Tigray region was sealed off from the outside world. Cell phone service and internet were cut, roads were blockaded, routes out patrolled by armed men. The goal was to create an impassable barrier, a way to ensure nothing could get in or out of Ethiopia's restive region. And that nothing included two extremely vital things, food and medicine. So let's start with the impact the blockade had on healthcare. It's thought to be responsible for 30% of all civilian casualties. With no regular supplies of humanitarian aid allowed in, Tigray ran out of medical necessities. This included things like gauze and antiseptics that are essential for treating war wounds. Reports from the time talk of nurses reduced to trying to clean wounds with warm salt water. But it also included civilian medicines like antibiotics, insulin, and even vaccines. No one in Tigray received a COVID-19 shot until the ceasefire in the summer of 2022. The cumulative effect of starving hospitals of these basic supplies can be seen by just having a glance at the mortality statistics. In the city of Makile, Tigray's last working maternity hospital during the conflict, well, they reported a five-fold increase in women dying during childbirth. At the University of Ghent, researchers tracking the conflict found that Ethiopia's overall mortality rate jumped in those two years from 6 per thousand to 18 per thousand. That's as bad as it was back in 1990, just as the nation was emerging from famine and civil war. Grim as the lack of medicine was, though, it was the blockade on food supplies that was the real killer. Prior to the war, Tigray was a region that was mostly self-sufficient. People grew nearly enough to sustain themselves and imported the small bit extra that they needed. Once conflict broke out, though, that self-sufficiency vanished. Governments aligned forces, torched crops and killed livestock. Militia confiscated harvests. Fertilizers were redirected to other parts of the country. Then, once agriculture had been decimated, the government refused to allow any food shipments or humanitarian aid in. What followed was the sort of famine not seen in Ethiopia since the 1980s. By spring of 2021, the International Integrated Food Security Phase Classification placed 5.5 million people at emergency levels of hunger, with another 350,000 at catastrophic levels. Remember, Tigray's pre-war population was around 6 million. The blockade was starving nearly the entire region. When hunger really took hold, the University of Ghent research project estimates between 437 and 914 people were starving to death every single day. It was a deliberate policy of using hunger to wage war, to break the will of the population, to drive them into camps and bleed local support for the TPLF dry. In this way, it's thought the Ethiopian government caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of ordinary people. But while this explains how the war came to be so deadly, it doesn't explain the other great mystery today, how the world broadly came to ignore it. Not in the sense that no one was writing about it, you can easily Google contemporary articles on the crisis, but in the sense that it seemed to drive no global conversation, it seemed to make few headlines, it sparked no concerted worldwide effort to stop the killing. In other words, how Tigray became the 21st century's invisible war. In August of 2022, the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, made an explosive claim about the global response to Tigray. As reported in The Guardian, the WHO chief explicitly linked the silence to racism, saying, quote, I haven't heard in the last few months any head of state talking about the Tigray situation anywhere in the developed world. Anywhere. Why? Maybe the reason is the color of the skin of the people in Tigray. Now, this wasn't the first time Dr. Tedros himself, an ethnic Tigrayan, had said something similar. In April 2022, he claimed that the greater attention shown to the Ukraine war was the result of racial bias, declaring, quote, I don't know if the world really gives equal attention to black and white lives. 
Far be it for us to dismiss his theory, clearly there are often racial dynamics at work in crisis reporting, and it's something people need to take seriously. However, it's not at all clear that that was the case with the Tigray War. While it's true Ukraine received far more coverage in 2022, the conflict in Tigray had already been running for well over a year by that point. And while you could plausibly construct a theory that bad timing kept it off the front pages as it broke out at the height of the pandemic and a divisive US presidential election, there's likely a much simpler reason, a reason we already discussed in the previous chapter the blockade. When Abbey's forces sealed off Tigray, they didn't just stop people from escaping and aid from getting in. They also created an information blackout, one that saw almost no journalists able to access the affected regions, while a lack of electricity and service meant that no one inside could broadcast the atrocities that they were witnessing. There's no doubt that this was intentional. As well as destroying the TPLF, the government wanted to make sure no outside actor would step in and stop the war. Sadly, in our hypervisual culture, that lack of images, had exactly the effect that Abby wanted. Unable to see for themselves what was going on, the global public simply let the war pass them by. Slate had a fascinating piece on the effects of the blackout and how it helped shape public opinion. In it, they looked at other crises that governments are hiding from journalists and social media, such as China's persecution of the Uyghurs or Uganda's post-election unrest, and concluded that, quote, an information blackout keeps the news and with it the sense of global crisis remote. In other words, a flood of images, videos, and content relating to a modern war such as in Ukraine, Iraq, or Syria ensures that it's always at the forefront of global opinion. But find a way to turn off that tap and, uh, well, just watch it disappear from the headlines. It's a skill Abby's government seems to have mastered. They didn't just cut off all communications in Tigray and block international journalists from entering. They expelled UN officials and foreign observers, used anti-fake news legislation to jail and silence local reporters. Aid workers who did manage to enter Tigray were barred from taking anything that could carry images like hard drives or USBs. Cell phones were searched by government forces to make sure they contained no pictures or recordings. In this way, the siege of Tigray didn't just succeed in sealing the region off, it also succeeded in making sure that the world didn't care, in creating a sort of global blind spot in our vision where we knew bad things were happening but lacked the tools to see and understand what those bad things might be. It's a terrifying lesson to learn that a determined government can, in the most connected era in history, still censor a massive war that's taking place effectively erasing its atrocities from human consciousness. Worse, it's a lesson the government seem eager to follow. Back in the 1990s, the internet promised a future of radical openness, where those in power would be incapable of hiding anything they did. Well, today, we're witnessing the death of that dream. If Ethiopia's government can effectively hush up the deadliest war of the century, who knows what bigger, better-funded nations might be capable of concealing? It might seem obvious. But the Tigray War blackout shows why we still desperately need journalists and freedom of the press. And why oh, we should be very, very wary of governments who try to limit those things. Because the victims of the Tigray conflict deserved more than to die in secrecy. After so much suffering, the least they deserve is for their stories, for their people's tragedy, to be better known.